I've truncated my title down to wet and dry environmental cycles and alternative building blocks uh, in prebiotic chemistry. And as Bruce said, I'm going to talk about some of the successes we've had in the Center for Chemical Evolution. I'm also going to start out with some of our guiding principles, or if you will, truisms and hypotheses that have been guiding our research. You can decide whether you think something is true or it's a hypothesis or outright questionable. Um, I'll say that we follow the principle life is based on polymers, that the emergence of biopolymers was essential to the origins of life, and that the synthesis, that the first synthesis of biopolymers was a result of geophysical, geochemical cycles, and what I'd like to just say, special organic molecules. Special as in special properties, not necessarily rare. Um, and I'll continue and say that the molecules and reactions that gave rise to the first biopolymers were simple, maybe special, but simple, and robust. And I'll go on to say that this is a principle that's been guiding us uh, for over a decade. And we say that if an experimental mo model for a particular step in the origin of life is correct, then we think that the model should solve more problems than just the problem that the model is designed to solve. In the very least, it should not generate more. But ideally, if you're on the right track, it should solve more problems than you know. And if that's true, then you should discover what we call bonus solutions. So I'll start with inspiration on the design of our experiments, and that's extant biopolymers. And all of these are synthesized uh, by what are called condensation bonds, such as two amino acids linked together give off water in the formation of a condensation bond. You keep doing that, adding amino acids each time a water comes off to make a polypeptide. Same thing with polysaccharides, nucleic acids, and lipids. Those type of bonds present what is the first problem that we had to address, which is the best place to form condensation bonds is in a hot, dry environment. Because if you want to drive this reaction to the right, you want to get rid of water. So a surface, arid surface is the best place. But biopolymers, they fold, they function, and they evolve in water. We know that's a principle of them. So we look for simple solutions. That's what we've been focused on. A simple solution to this is that the polymers of life were originally formed on the surface of the earth as a result of wet, dry cycles. Uh, this is not a new idea. We think that it's, though, parsimoniously the most obvious solution to it fits really well uh, with the chemistry of the polymers uh, with possible environments on the earth. However, early on we ran into another problem with this, which is that this idea, again, is not new, and attempts to make polypeptides by simply drying and heating amino acids have not provided satisfactory results. We know that some of the earliest attempts to make biopolymers were from Sidney Fox and his collaborators and back in the 50s. They had a result of pretty high temperatures that resulted in non-peptide products. Uh, there's been some nice advances in, in that area, again, but we've got some issues still. Uh, Lahav, Rode, and others have looked to do this under uh, lower temperatures where you don't get those side products. Uh, they typically get pretty low yields, about 1 to 2% of just dipeptides or tripeptides. So a possible solution to this problem is that polypeptides are preceded by what we'll call proto-polypeptides with structures, chemical linkages that are similar but distinct, okay? And that's important. Just change one atom and it can totally change the chemical properties of a molecule. So they were similar but distinct from polypeptides. So an obvious one would be that polypeptides were preceded by polyesters, again, not an not an original idea. The ester linkage was proposed uh, back at least 1971 by Rich, and, and then later Orgel discussed it. And, and we like this idea a lot because amino acids have hydroxy acids as analogs, just change the amino group to a hydroxyl group there. And hydroxy acids, they're used in life today. They're produced in Miller-Urey experiments. They're found in meteorites. So it looked like a, a real possibility that life would have started with polyesters. So that's a simple solution. And what we did find is that if we dry down uh, these hydroxy acids, we do make ester-linked 
uh, oligomers, just shown here as a lactic acid dimer. Um, but this is the first bonus that we found in pursuing this, um, is that hydroxy acids catalyze peptide bond formation. And what we found is that uh, if we mix amino acids in with the products of, of, of hydroxy acid condensation, or even just start at the beginning and mix them all together, uh, that we have amine ester exchange that leads to peptide bond formation. So that, to us, was, was a big bonus. And so we thought the idea of using hydroxy acid looks like a really good route to polypeptides. Now, there were some other bonuses that came out. Um, what we found is that if you look in the literature, there was quite um, a bias on just drawing down the amino acids on what the composition is, what sequences were favored. And what we found from the start, just mixing uh, glycine and alanine, that we were able to get all the sequences that were possible. Uh, this is our initial results where we're just doing alanine and glycine and just looking at uh, these pentamers here where just based upon the molecular weight, uh, they have two lactic acids and, and th uh, one alanine and, one, and two glycines and we see that we get all possible sequences. We took this further where we did mixtures with more amino acids and more hydroxy acids and what we found is that the sequence space that we generated uh, is enormous. In fact, uh, we had to develop new methods. That's what's illustrated here by these 3D plots, actually even in a four-dimensional plot, to show the diversity of products that, that we're generating. So it's, uh, again, a big bonus uh, beyond what we had expected there. And I'm going to add one very recent bonus that's going to come out very uh, soon, which is that drying these mixtures where we look at the difference between the proteinaceous amino acids and non-proteinaceous, that is those that are found in the coating of proteins versus those that are not, there seems to be a preference here for the incorporation, at least in the cationic amino acids for the proteinaceous ones, which may be telling us something about why and how early uh, lysine and arginine were selected into polypeptides. So uh, this study here was headed up by Moran Pinter and Luke Lehman and Lauren Williams, really acting as the main PIs on this project. And as I said, this is coming out very soon, just accepted yesterday. And if you want to hear a talk on this, uh, Moran is giving a talk tomorrow on this. <coughs> so there's a similar story uh, when it comes to nucleic acids, and I will openly admit nucleic acids are more complex than polypeptides. Uh, we know you can make the building blocks of uh, polypeptides, amino acids, and model prebiotic reactions. There's a lot of challenges with sugars, less with bases, there's challenges with phosphate, but then these all have to be connected into nucleotides and then polymerized. So those are additional challenges. So, in the CCE, we've also been hypothesizing that RNA is a result of multiple evolutionary steps, that the base, sugar, connecting molecules have all changed, something that we wrote about in a paper we called My Grandfather's Axe a few years ago. And again, what are the problems that we have with nucleic acids? Well, one of them is that in a simple model prebiotic reaction where the extant bases are dried with ribose, uh, they produce nucleosides in either low yield or in no yield. So this has been a big problem uh, in the field. Again, a simple solution to this could be that the nucleobases uh, that were in proto-RNA, an uh, ancestor of RNA, were different. Uh, in this case, we've looked at melamine, I'm showing you here, and barbituric acid. You could see this is perhaps taking the place of adenine and this is taking the place of uracil. We tested these molecules in simple dry down reactions. Uh, melamine gives us 55% yield of both the alpha and beta anomers of uh, the nucleotides, and barbituric acid gives us 82. So these work really well. Uh, we also get bonuses, though. These alternative nucleobases, those that form glycosides uh, very easily with ribose, with ribose, also form them with many different sugars. Basically, every sugar that we tested, except for some modified sugars, uh, are showing the formation of glycosides with our bases. Um, so this could relax the constraints on getting ribose first. Um, David Fialo and Tyler Roach are working on this, so you can talk to them. They're here at this meeting, and Tyler is giving a, a talk tomorrow. Uh, on this topic. 
Another bonus that we found is that these alternative nucleobases self-assemble in water as monomers. The extant bases don't do that. Uh, you can see here, this is an AFM image of non-covalent assemblies. Um, yet another bonus that we found with this is that they have a very, very strong propensity to adopt homochiral domains. Uh, Dr. Shanish uh, Karunkaranan is here, and he will be giving a poster tonight and a lightning talk on Friday about how these plausible prebiotic bases uh, make these uh, homochiral domains, which we're quite excited about. Yet another bonus is that if we take what we've learned from our polypeptide work and our nucleo base work, our proto base work, we put them together and we can now suggest what might be possible structures for proto-RNA. These are just theoretical, but I think that these have a lot of the attributes that we would look, be looking for for a very simple system uh, that could be composed out of plausible prebiotic building blocks that could polymerize and start to evolve. And again, David and Sunish are here, and David will be giving a poster tonight and a lightning talk about this system. So these are not all of the collaborators in the CCE, but I've tried to pick the ones that I've highlighted the work on. You can see this is a huge team effort, and I feel very fortunate to work with so many talented people. And there's even more. Here's the, at the last center meeting here. Uh, and so I've got to thank everyone in the CCE and members of my lab uh, for contributing to these projects in such a, a wonderful, uh, insightful way. And also uh, to NSF and NASA Astrobiology for funding our center. Thank you. Time for a couple of, of questions for Nick, if uh, if you'd like to line up. We have one here. Hi, I'm Mike Wong from the University of Washington. I'm really intrigued by the idea that the original nucleobases could have been different from the ones that we see today. And I was wondering if you've identified any plausible reasons why there was a switch from those original nucleobases that you suggest to the ones that uh, that we find in RNA today. So one of the principles we've also been operating on is with respect to the nucleobases, we think that easy to form nucleosides also translates to easy to have them break apart. And so that's what we see. The, the, the extant ones are definitely more stable. So one reason could be that a transition took place to make what is proto-RNA, when it's becoming RNA, a more stable molecule uh, at the nucleobase level. Um, also, there are some reasons, if we draw them out, that we can think about in terms of diversity of structures and baking, breaking symmetry between the base pairs and the minor groove, for example, that really point to the extant ones being superior to what we're looking at. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Steve Banner uh, sort of is arguing that the, or that the origin of RNA is a solved um, problem and thinks that it uh, was the first prebiotic polymer. And um, I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. I'm, I'm going to accept that, that the problem is solved for a plausible prebiotic polymer when somebody can take ingredients that, that you know, I'd say at least a quarter of us in the room would say those are plausible building blocks and puts it through a very simple cycle such as hydration, dehydration cycles and we can do an analysis and we've got oligomers that are long enough to fold up and maybe show some signs of, of rudimentary evolution. When that's done, then I'll say, okay, I can accept that as what, a problem. What I said, Lauren, was that several of the key paradoxes that made it appear as if the RNA world model was impossible have been resolved. What I have now done, and I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, is that there are now, when you solve a certain set of these paradoxes, you encounter new ones. And so those are the ones that are now uh, where focus should be directed if you want to develop that as a model for the first Darwinism. Next to each other. I think that we're 
We're on time. Um, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so for the sake of staying on schedule, our, yeah, let's do it. <laughs>